thank you all for joining today. Um, we're going to wait a minute or two to let the uh, rest of the uh, attendees trickle in before we get started. give everyone another another minute or so All right. I think just about everybody has joined. Um, first off, let me say thank you for everyone joining our Industry Next event brought to you by Entitle. Uh, today, we just want to talk about the Chief Installed Base Officer role and how it's really a breakthrough industrial role for 2022. And some rules of the road just as the meeting continues and the event goes on. Uh, if any issues arise, feel free to utilize the chat icon on your bottom left-hand toolbar. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the event, feel free to utilize that Q&A button right next to the uh, chat icon. And then also uh, the recording will be provided post event. And if you'd like a copy of the presentation, feel free to reach out to aaron.arnold at entitled.com to receive that. And we will send over the presentation as well. So hosting our event today is our, I'd like to introduce our CEO and co-founder co of Entitled Vivek Joshi. Uh, Vivek has roughly 30 years of industrial B2B OEM uh, experience, whether it be just sales or the aftermarket or the C-level uh, position. And Vivek's really passionate about the opportunities that are available for OEMs to really transform their install base. And that's where he kind of came up with the idea of the chief install base officer. So without further ado, Vivek, take over. Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, we uh, look, we have a really nice showing today. Appreciate it. Uh, we've got people from all over the world, literally, as far as India and definitely in Europe and the uh, U.S. Uh, and the Middle East. We are fortunate to have a really big gathering today to join us in this uh, interesting webinar. I think that'll be, uh, I think, uh, beneficial and educational for most of you on the call today. So, without further ado, I want to get into some of these, um, some of the material I have to share with you today. So. Uh, we expect this agenda to uh, this agenda to take about 40 minutes or so. I think we've bookmarked it for about 45 minutes. And there's really three main topics we want to cover. You know, what is really the notion of a chief install base officer? We're going to share with you everything we can. Uh, we we outlined about this. We're going to actually have a conversation with a couple of uh, industry people. Uh, one is Bella Abrams, who's a practitioner, uh, and she's really the chief install base officer for a division of Baker Hughes. And then Sam Clydman, who's been around the industry for a long time, and, and talks a lot about aftermarket and really the install base and its role in it. And we've got Sam as a guest as well. I'll share some of that with you. And then at the end, I'd like to wrap up with some takeaways and Q&A that you may have. So I expect this whole thing to take about 40, 45 minutes or so, and uh, it should be a pretty crisp, fast-moving event. So in terms of uh, how we think about this, right, so you guys have taken a bit of time out of your schedule today to, to participate here and attend the session. So what's in it for you? Really, it's about sharing a, what we call a unique and new point of view, right? why this is such an important role uh, for an OEM, and we want to make sure you kind of understand that and take that away. The secondly, there's some great industry experiences, uh, lessons learned, if you may, we all like to learn from one another, uh, what's in it there in terms of what you can learn from it, uh, and then really going forward, how do you operationalize, how do you make this real in your own company? And those are the three things I want to make sure we kind of uh, 
uh, aggress uh, by the time they finish this call here. So uh, before we go any further, right, uh, I'd love to just get a poll going, if you don't mind. DJ, please start the poll. You know, if you were to look around your own company, how many different functions do you think deal with the install base that you have today? So if you don't mind uh, popping up the survey, DJ, and uh, we can get going. The survey is running. Is the survey running, BJ? Yes, it is right. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, finally seeing it here. Thank you. Great. So while the survey runs, uh, I wanted to kind of cover a couple of things over here. So we've always talked about install base. And so one of the things we did recently is said, let's go to uh, our favorite social media channel in terms of uh, what we all look as B2B practitioners. We went to LinkedIn. And so what we did is just put in a search term called install base and look for people. And, you know, we found some extraordinary large numbers of uh, Search results coming back, anything from 150 to 189,000 results coming back. And as you can see, all these people have some form of install base in their title, on the job description, and so on and so forth. And we do know for a fact that while there's so many people who with this particular uh, phrase in their title or job uh, description, there's probably many more who don't have it, who actually have a substantial uh, role, substantial responsibility in covering the install base. And we think it's really rapidly growing rapidly emerging role uh, across the world. So we said, let's take a look at this thing and start seeing where things go with the, uh, with the market. And so before I get into this slide, DJ, maybe you can go and uh, share the results of the install base, uh, the, the survey in terms of how many functions today uh, uh, cover the install base. So it's actually fascinating. So service, aftermarket, yep, sales, marketing, support, fascinating. Yeah, in fact, we can see all of the above. It's, uh, none of the above is a minority, and maybe there are some companies that really don't do it, and all of the above is actually an interesting answer, right? So to some degree, the way we think about it is, you know, if you start thinking about the value of the install base, uh, it's extraordinarily high for a company. Uh, first of all, you have a huge portfolio of aftermarket products and services that your customers are buying from you. It's very profitable, right? As uh, we all know that 20 30% of a manufacturing and operating profit tends to come from the install base may be even higher in some instances. And what's actually interesting is from the equipment sales side or capital asset sales side, we've seen time and time again where almost 70, 80% of your new equipment sales come from existing customers. And as we saw at the beginning of the 2020 pandemic recession, um, you know, many companies that were able to weather the storm a little bit better than the others actually had a robust aftermarket and services business. So it's actually, uh, the install base really lends itself well to kind of become a both a growth engine as well as shock absorber uh, for a manufacturer. And so that's what we see as a value of this thing. And when you start looking at the OEM's functions that look uh, across the installed base, we saw exactly what the survey said, right? So if you think about the survey, you know, we had pretty much everybody uh, looking at a different percentage, but they're all the same with the exception of service. And when you take a look at this, uh, this image, this graphic, it basically is what we see today, right? The majority of the OEM's functions work with the install base. In fact, all of the above work with the install base. But when we start thinking about, you know, who really cares about this, who really is responsible for it, you know, as we start talking to people, and of course, over the many years, we've talked to probably several hundred companies and asked this question, who's the person responsible, who's the leader responsible for the install base? And, you know, we start finding out that because of the magnitude, because of the, uh, the, uh, the large dispersion responsibilities, Nobody really knows what's going on, right? We routinely ask people, so tell us a little bit about your install base. How big is it, right? How many assets do you have out in the field? What size of the percentage uh, of the install base really transacts with you every day? You know, uh, how big is the customer base in terms of accounts and locations? The fact of the matter is that it's really hard to put together, right? And I always put this image in front of people with the six blind men and an elephant, and every function has its own uh, unique uh, system, own unique solution, and but they also disperse, they're so siloed, they never speak to one another. And so this is really some of the things that we see as a big problem in the industry right now. And so when you start asking people who owns the install base, it's the old, uh, you know, pointing to each other, right? It's not that nobody wants to take responsibility, but just the way things are structured in a company, 
it really is no ownership uh, at the at the highest level. Nobody accountable for it at the single uh, single throat to choke, as we say, within a company for the install base. And so that's some one of the big, big issues we think needs to be addressed in the industry as well. So this sets me up for the second poll question, right? So if I were to ask you folks who owns the install base in a company, the previous question asks which functions are involved, which functions deal with the install base. This question says who all deals with the install base, or other, in this case, sorry, who owns the install base. So it'll be great to get your point of view on this one, get your survey. So DJ, thank you very much, the ownership of the install base. So if you folks, if you don't mind just quickly uh, uh, responding to the poll, that'd be great. Uh, and I'm going to just go on mute for a second because in this particular instance, I actually want this survey to play out a little bit before you advance any further. Vivek, I think some of the attendees could not see the results of the previous survey. So towards the end or, you know, right after this, we can show both results before we proceed. Yes, thank you. I will do that. <clears throat> While people are voting, maybe. Uh, okay, never mind. We can We can let the survey run and then go to the previous results. Yeah, let's finish this one on the DJ and I'll, I'll let you bring up the other previous uh, results as well. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, maybe we can just uh, end the survey, DJ. Great. So what's fascinating is then I look at these results here, I see aftermarket and service, which would be a natural owners, if you may, uh, for this thing. But I've also seen the answer, not sure, no one, sales, uh, IT, which is an interesting answer, chief service officer, yep, I see that sometimes, and then others. But the point is that there is no single answer right now. So DJ, maybe if you want to go back to the previous survey, I, I don't know, if, I don't think I can do it, but if you don't mind showing that uh, the result, if you don't mind. There you go. So the functions that deal with it are myriad, right? It's everybody in an organization that really deals with it. And, to some degree, it's the complication where you have so many people dealing with it. It's like we say, if you have too many priorities, you have none. In this case, if you have so many people that deal with it, everybody's looking at one another and there's no real ownership. So I think that is really the setup, if you may, uh, for, the, uh, for the webinar today. So the good news about this is while there is uncertainty, while there's lack of clarity in terms of who really owns the install base, you know, some companies are taking matters in their own hands. So we've, again, gone back to our favorite uh, social media networks, uh, LinkedIn, and started looking at some information out here. And sure enough, you start seeing people here who have actually ownership, if you may, of these roles, right? Uh, we've been appointed as uh, install-based directors, as you can see at KSP or Bentley Nevada or Accuray, which is, uh, you know, uh, one of these companies out here in, in the U.S. So we're beginning to start seeing this role come about now. And so the question then becomes is, what do you do about it on a systematic, scalable basis? And so we've been formulating this uh, point of view for the last um, year or two, if you may, that there needs to be a, in the creation of a new role uh, called chief install base officer. And in our mind, it is really the orchestration of the activities, it's a harmonization, coordination of all the activities that relate to the install base. As one of our customers famously said to me many years ago, he said, Vivek, I want to be able to do all things install base and have complete harmony. And they were not seeing it, right? And just exactly like you saw in the, the survey question, sales touch the same customer, service touch the same customer, tech support touch the same customer. And there was no single harmonious view of how you come across to, uh, to your end, end user. And so the ability to provide a systematic scalable uh, experience is important. And certainly as you start seeing some of the transitions going on in the workforce, a uh, superior customer experience matters. Uh, net promoter scores, uh, customer experience, customer retention, all these things matter. And so when you start looking at the skill sets required, it's a bit different, right? It's about thinking about the customer back uh, and coming back to you. It's understanding data, it's understanding processes and software. It's trying to figure out how to be the team player who brings people together to kind of get the result to the customer. So it's really extraordinarily different in, in, in some cases uh, for some companies, we are trying to break these silos and come to, a, come to an integrated whole. And that's going to create opportunities for some people, but it's also going to create conflict for some people. But the way we think about it is the chief install base officer really is the core in the OEM to become the customer's, your end user's trusted partner, right? And that's really the setup out here, if you may, for the next few minutes in this conversation. So there's enough, uh, you know, enough polls, enough information for where we uh, come from. Uh, what I'd like to do is now maybe bring in our guests uh, to talk about uh, what they see in the industry. So Let's talk to a couple of practitioners out here. 
So without further ado, I want to introduce you to two people. Uh, one is Bella Abrams, and the second one is Sam Kleidman. So with that, uh, Bella, maybe you can introduce yourself to us and uh, turn on your camera so maybe we can all see you as well. Uh, over to you, Bella. Maybe a quick introduction for yourself. All right. Thanks, Vivek. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Bella, and as Vivek and the team introduced, I'm the in, uh, service and install-based growth leader for Bentley Nevada. For those who don't know the, the company, we provide plant-wide and enterprise-wide solutions for uh, machinery protection and condition monitoring. And we have a global reach and decades in, in the field. So a lot of, certainly our install base is, is pretty big. Um, I have just started in the role. So the role is something new for the company. Um, I started in January this year. Uh, before that, I've been working in Baker Hughes, uh, assumed different positions around sales. Uh, sales and commercial. And in Bentley Nevada specific, I've worked in North America as the sales operations for the sales team there. And then I went to Europe to work with the whole Europe, Africa, and Russia region um, in strategic sales. So working on big global contracts to better attend our, our biggest customers. Um, and before that, I also have a, a, a little more diverse background in other industries, in the automotive industry mostly, in program management and supply chain that definitely helps um, uh, contribute to, to the work stream nowadays, right? So pleasure to be here again. Excellent. Well, thank you, Bella. Uh, Sam, over to you. A little bit of introduction in yourself, if you don't mind. Oh, thank you very much, Vivek. So... Uh, my background is kind of mixed. A big chunk of it in the earlier days was in manufacturing. I've been a VP of manufacturing of a number of startups and even one bigger one. And then I moved into customer service and headed up two customer service organizations. The first was in data communications, where we supported the largest, most critical installations outside of the outside of the Defense Department. Uh, we took care of customers like the New York Stock Exchange and Bank of America and those guys. And then I moved on to a British company heading up their America service in analytical and scientific instruments and semiconductor processing. And for a while, we also owned the medical business. So now uh, Middlesex Consulting is my business. I've been here now for about 15 years. And what I try to do is work with industrial companies that are trying to grow their service revenue and profitability. And I do a lot of writing, which I enjoy. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Sam and Bella. So without further ado, I would kind of jump into some questions here. Uh, so, you know, what I'd like to understand, if you don't mind, uh, Sam and Bella, and I'm going to start with Bella first. You know, people come to these roles in different ways. So, Bella, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how this role came about. Uh, you know, why was the role created and structured? Because this is clearly a new role for Bentley Nevada as well. So maybe a little bit of background of the thinking that made this role happen. It'll be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so what can I say? What I can say is that it wasn't a, a well-planned role, but the Bentley was going through a restructuring on the whole organization. And the install-based efforts were something that were always uh, present in, in the company strategy, but we always worked a lot in silos. So as I said, we have been in the industry for more than 60 years, and we have a, a lot of scattered data all around. And the team, so services uh, needs a lot of this, this information to perform the, their work. Um, sales needs that to increase uh, our penetration and to bear attend our customers. But we never got a, a good traction and progress because of, of this, uh, the, the concern we had on, on pulling all the data together. And that's how we, uh, the leadership came up with this idea. Um, and, and invited me as, as I was working in strategic sales to, to come with the challenge. It, and I was glad to, to grab it because I know it's a very fruitful um, area that we should work with. Yeah. Excellent. 
And uh, who do you report to? Do you report to the sales or service? Do you work with both of them? Uh, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I work with sales. So I, I'm under the sales organization, though I worked out a lot with the service team too. But the idea is, and, and they do have a central point of contact on their side too. Um, so they work a lot in collecting the data, improving our database. And I work on the part of uh, generating meaningful insights for sales to work with, generating campaigns and having a lot of interface on pacing the teams on the growth that we have for the, the campaigns that we launch based on the information we have for our customers. Got it, got it. And one last question, when you think about uh, what you just said at the end, right, you work with sales and service, uh, who is the referee? Who is the tiebreaker if there's any, any contention between sales and service? As you look at this information, as you try to kind of bring some harmony, if you may, in terms of how you go after the customers, uh, is there a tiebreaker? Is there a referee in the process? Uh, because it theoretically should be you, but there must be somebody else who's a referee in the process. I'm just curious how that works. Mm, well, does, does that question um, make sense? Kind of. I'll, I'll answer and you yeah. tell me that <laughs> if it yeah. makes sense. Um, well, our sales team is usually, and well, sales and services are not the, the only teams that I work with. Um, I certainly work a lot with the, the product team, for example, to understand what are the, the meaningful campaigns. But definitely sales has the, the last call on what are the campaigns that make sense for us to go for, right? What are the ones that would bring more to the company? And services are the ones providing us, uh, supplying us with the data that will help us grow this campaign. But if I'd say a tiebreaker, it would be sales, a short answer, yeah. Got it. Got it. Excellent. So, Sam, what, what's interesting is that, you know, when I thought about inviting you to come to this event, uh, what intrigued me was the article you wrote back, I think, in November. You published it on ThomasNet, and then it was published on LinkedIn as well, about install-based selling. You definitely took the sales perspective to it, even though you had a, a long career in service and support and so on and so forth. How does that jive with what Bella just said, which is sales as a tiebreaker? Is that consistent of why you wrote that article or what you see with the people you work with and the experiences you have? Well, that, that article totally focused on aftermarket selling. So, so it was, it was, it was easy because that's, that's what I've been doing and that's what I consult in. Uh, but it's, it, I, I think in, in the world that I came from with smaller companies, we didn't always have this contention because our service engineers were the ones who were on site and, and the big things that always changed are either the contact names and the, the the owner of the equipment, their phone number, email address, those kind of things. And more often than not, it was our service engineers on site who identify, oh, there's a new person there and and fed that back. And But we worked hard in both companies for our service engineers and their sales peers to really closely communicate because both groups were geographically centered and we pretty much use the same territories. So if I yeah, service yeah. engineer, you know, service engineer goes into a customer and finds that there's a new user of equipment, he'd report it back to our service marketing person, but he also would pick up the phone and send or send an email to the sales guy who might live two towns away and say, Hey, do you know that down at IBM, the contact on this piece of equipment changed from Mary to somebody else. So we, yeah. we resolved those issues in real time and, and it was primarily driven by the service folks. Great. So now one clarification, not maybe a clarification question, but an informational question for you, if you don't mind, Sam. Sure. You've seen, you've worked across a number of industries, both prior to starting a consulting company and also now as a consultant. Right. Have you seen many instances of, a situation where there's a creation of this install based officer role, just like Bella has been uh, appointed to this role. Do you see that uh, in many companies that you uh, that you work with or they're, they're familiar with? I, I don't see that. What I what I see is that, it, and, and I will preface that that is from my perspective, which is folk, looking into the service organization. But uh, the service organization and the service sellers specifically really care about getting their database current. And interestingly, uh, 
I worked, I, I was smart enough one time to hire a very experienced field service manager from a large company. And he kept, brought him in as a service marketing guy. And he set up a, a service database because we didn't have a, a universal one that really worked. And uh, w- what he s- suggested was that every year around the holiday season, Christmas time, we sent out little gifts, you know, calendars or pens or something. And if and then we said, you know, return if undeliverable. And so we, we could find out pretty w- frequently you know, who changed that we didn't know about. And when we looked at the data over a number of years, it seemed like over the course of a year, 10% of our contacts that we thought were still there weren't. I don't know if that number is consistent with what you've seen, but that, that's what we saw. You know, it's actually interesting. I'm going to pick up that thread later. But yes, we see that actually pretty significantly. Most of our customers, the last mile problem they have is not just identifying is my equipment there as an operational, but who do I call tends to be a pretty extraordinarily large problem. Right. Um, when I, I'm going to switch back to Bella for a second, if you don't mind. Uh, so Bella, you've been in place now for about two months. What has been the biggest challenge you've faced in this role? Um, well, the biggest challenge by far is um, matching the databases because we have we are such a big company with very different types of product uh, and and very um, long history. We many times don't have the, the data enough that we need to drive the the valuable campaigns, and even if we do, the data don't communicate with each other. So. If we want to check a certain profile of customer that has two or three type, different types of product, it's hard to put this, all this information together and generate automatically the, um, the campaign. So a big work is being on cleaning the data and actually working on providing meaningful pipeline for the sales team to work with. Interesting. Have you had to, uh, when, it, when you think about the challenges, think of the other side of the challenge, which is what has been the most uh, gratifying or what has been the most exciting development as part of this role for you? And what are the near uh, short, uh, quick quick wins, if you may, that uh, that yeah. have come about because of your, uh, with your new role? It, it, I guess it's exactly the, the other extreme is when we can, we are able to provide this insight for the, the team. And now that we, so two months now, and we are starting to see some traction on, on the pipeline, on, the, on the, the growth. So we certainly are, are, are being able to better attend our customer to improve the, their experience. I guess this is the, the biggest accomplishment that we are seeing um, because many people may, so sales managers could say, well, I know my customer, so there's no need for us to, to do all this job. But when we actually can, uh, target something that were not on the top of their minds before. That's something that that shows the value of the work, right? Perfect, perfect. It says that there's a orchestration and the coordination stuff. Now uh, I'm going to switch to to Sam for a second. So Sam, you were in support. You also ran services. You also now focus on installed based selling. You know the the reason for us being so passionate about the point of view about the install base and the coordination and orchestration piece is that, you know, I'm old enough to tell people the stories that, you know, back in the back in the day when Hewlett Packard was big and ascendant, there was a famous story about the CEO going to visit a customer one day and they had five Tauruses parked in front of the customer. And back then, and I think there's a couple of HP people on this call, HP's uh, official uh, car was for, for well, it was a Ford Taurus. And the CEO looked and said, who are these five people? Well, it's a service guy, it's a field tech, it's a sales guy, it's so-and-so. Is that a problem that's being addressed, Sam, in your mind? Or are we getting too transactional, too tactical on data and selling versus really giving a, uh, a single uh, uh, uniform customer experience uh, to, the, to the customer? Good question. So the reason I'm laughing, because I've heard that same exact story in the analytical and scientific instrument business, except it was about Thermo Fisher. Uh, and yeah, same, five people, same story. So... Yeah, no, no. It, the, the individual product lines are individual and they, they yeah, nobody wants to give up control 
of the customer facing functions. Uh, nobody wants to say, well, we're going to have a, uh, a comprehensive, all singing, all dancing salesperson who can sell all these products into this company. But each of the business owners, the MDs, the presidents of divisions, they're all compensated purely on what their revenue and profitability is. And so to, to trust another organization or a, a separate one or a shared one to get the results and in, in, impacts their wallet, very hard to do, really hard. So fascinating. It's the old adage, right? Uh, what gets measured and gets paid for gets done. Right? right. And so in this case, it sounds like unless you start measuring and compensating people for the overall success of the account, for the overall success of the company, this whole notion of having an integrated point of view, an integrated approach to the customer through one, one channel won't work because of exactly what you just said. Right. Absolutely. It's absolutely the case, unequivocally. So are there, so, you know, obviously the, 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 point of, uh, the point of view that we brought to the party said, look, there needs to be a single accountable person or an organization called the installed base officer. Is that something, uh, Sam, I know you said you haven't seen it. Is that something you're seeing is going to become apparent in some of these companies or, or take a form of a chief customer role in some companies or, or some other role, what are you seeing and what are you, what are you sensing or uh, hearing from the people you talk to every day? Well, if you think about the purpose of the business, it's to, it's to grow. One of the purposes is to grow their, and support their shareholders. So in the service side, if you think about it, there are four things that are required in order to sell. You need to have the right products, the right price, the right sales process and salespeople, and the right information about who, who your contact is, who your customer is. Each of those on their own are necessary, but the four together are the only combination that is sufficient. And I think that as customers are, are more sophisticated and more importantly, more dependent on the aftermarket revenue to balance the declining product revenue and, mar and margins, they're going to focus more and more on service selling and the service selling people are going to demand a, a accurate database that not only has phone numbers, emails, and that kind of thing, but that easily gives them the history of uh, what's going on over the past year. If they have, if your customer has a service contract, how many service calls and how much, how many, how much parts were consumed and those kind of things. So I think, that the, the focus on service revenue is going to drive that consolidation and responsibility for somebody to own the, the database. Got it. And Got it. So the old, uh, what, the, sorry, go ahead, Bella. Sorry. I, I, it's because <laughs> it's very much in line with the strategy of the company and why we chose to, uh, to have this role. And I saw that there is a question on the chat about that. Why do we choose to do this investment instead of continue doing the aftermarket? And I think it's completely in line with what Sam said. We are switching more and more to be more than just a supplier, but a partner of our customers. And we have customers with many different plans over uh, globally. Um, and as when we start to understand them better holistically, we can provide, we can attend them better. Um, and that's that's really the the basis of that. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Aaron. I see uh, Bella referenced a couple of questions. I see there's a couple of questions out there. Uh, do you want to go ahead and uh, pick up those questions? I see one from uh, uh, Leo Stevens and one from Zuna Summers. Do uh, you want to pick up one of them, Aaron? Yeah. Um, so for Sam or Bella or Vivek, um, how would a chief install base officer role be different than uh, a chief revenue officer or chief commercial officer, um, those roles are really already established. So what would really set them apart? The, the, I'll, I'll give you my two cents from there. And then Sam, maybe I see you put a hand up. Actually, why don't, Sam, you, why don't you go first? I'll, I'll come back to that later. Go ahead, Sam. Okay, so the differences are the outcomes that the individuals are responsible for. So the chief revenue officer is, is responsible for the outcome of the revenue generation process, 
where the, the chief installed base officer, whatever their title is, is responsible for the accuracy and timeliness of the information that enables the chief revenue officer to get his bonus. Uh, that's a good, uh, good uh, uh, differentiation in my mind, Sam. Bella, do you have a point of view or should I kind of give you my, uh, given my uh, response to the question? No, I guess Sam addressed it very well. So, feel free to so you know, the, the only nuance I would say to what uh, Sam said is uh, I agree with his definition. The, the one point I want to come back to is what Bella said, right? To some degree, uh, Sam, the way I think about chief install base officer is that it's about data, but it's also about the customer experience and being able to take a fractious, a disparate way of dealing with the customer and making it harmonious and making it orchestrated is really one of the other things we see as valuable. So singing from the same, same song sheet or working out the same quote unquote single source of truth is really important in creating a consistent and, and systematic customer experience. So that's the way all, we also think about it you know, from the experience perspective as well as the revenue and uh, productivity perspective actually for that matter as well. So it's like, just like the answer what you, what you said, Sam. Great. Okay. Uh, Aaron, there's a couple more questions I see you want to go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I have two more. Um, so I can kind of actually combine these into one, I think. So what uh, really makes the, or how do we make this chief install base role more standardized and well adopted? And then beyond that, how do you measure the KPIs for a chief install base officer compared to other, maybe something sim in a similar role? So can I turn this second half of the question to Bella? One of the questions Bella I was gonna ask you earlier is how was your boss your VP of sales gonna measure you for success, if you may, by the end of the year? Is it revenue? Is it uh, account penetration because you've got better data? What are the different KPIs that uh, your manager is gonna to use to measure your success? Yeah, and my, my two main KPIs um, are the quality of the data that we have. So right now we have a huge gap to, to fulfill. And we are working actively. And for that, I'm working together with all the different teams, services, products, marketing, to understand and, and compose this database. And the second one is the revenue we generate, we, is the orders we generate from there, right? How are we actually contributing to our customers so that we grow our market there, um, increase the, the penetration in them? So. Yeah. Is there any notion of uh, customer satisfaction to a net promoter score before and after or not really, not this year? Um, well, this is part of the strategy and there is another person uh, in my team too, entering to the, the sales organization, reporting to the sales organization that is working a lot on the customer experience on the, the NPS. And right now I'm working a lot on organizing the house, right? Um, establishing the database, running the campaign. But the idea is in the new, near future, we start to work together and see how we can strategize this in a way that we take into account the, the data, the, the customer experience more and more. Got it. Sam, do you have anything to add to the KPIs and uh, we'll come back to the role structure in a bit? Uh, the, the only thing I think is that the customer experience piece overlaps a lot of the uh, the data you know the customer database but the, the CX teams also deal with things that don't affect that are not really interacting with the, the installed base data you know things like a customer journey and yeah if, if the database is wrong and the customers have to repeat their information many times that's really a terrible situation but there are other things that the cx team focuses on that it requires different sets of skills and different experiences themselves so i i, I see that as a very, you know really close overlap and, and sharing got it got it uh, Aaron, there's another question. We'll take one last question before we try to wrap up. It's almost 11.40 here. I want to be sensitive to people's uh, investment in this uh, webinar today. Aaron? Yeah. Um, so, Bella, you kind of mentioned the having to organize, make sure your data is organized and clean, and then also uh, being measured on driving revenue. But what would you say is one of the most important skill or assets that a chief install base officer should have? Um, well, 
Um, I'll tell you right now, the mo the biggest skill that I, um, I have to exercise is the communication one, because I'm having to put lots of pieces together globally. Um, think about collecting data from the product team, from the service team, and running these campaigns with the, the uh, with the sales team and making translating that into data quality improvement. That's a, for sure. It's it's a very important skill. And and data analytics, um, being critical about the things you're reading and being able to generate meaningful insights. Um, this is very important for sure. Good question. Anything else, uh, Aaron, before we switch over to uh, the last part of the presentation and discussion today? Uh, yeah, I see one more question that just came in. Uh, what was the okay. inspiration behind the chief install base officer role? Um, Bella, right? It's not I, a, uh, I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell what was the inspiration for, Be for Bentley. Um, first thing is that because we have so many years in the market, that sometimes it happens that the, the sales manager comes to a plant, a new plant, and then they find a, an equipment of ours there. So where did we lose this customer that we didn't even know that it was a customer? This is uh, the big inspiration for us. We need to have a good understanding what, what is our install base and where we can better attend them. And that is kind of, of uh, a shame for us <laughs> to not know who is it out there. Um, and the second one is really the, the this is a strategy that we're talking so much about, uh, right now. We want to switch to a partner of our customers. We have very big customers. And when we go to, uh, when we go to global contracts, uh, global agreements, what we find is that we have a poor visibility on everything that we have out there with them. So how can we actually put together a, a valuable and accurate proposal if we need to take so much time on understanding what they actually have? And that goes to global customers, but that goes to smaller customers too that have one more than one plan. So these are mostly the, the inspirations we got. Yep, makes sense. Perfect. So Aaron, I know there might be some other questions coming in, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go skipping to the the last couple of slides. Arabella and Sam, thank you very much. Stay tuned. Uh, stay uh, stay uh, online if you don't mind. So, you know, I think uh, what we saw here in the last uh, 20, 30 minutes is there's absolutely information uh, orchestration that's required and knowledge, right? One of the things that I didn't hear explicitly come out, but Bella referred to at the end is like, if you really don't know your customer, how are you going to put together the right proposals and how are you going to really make the right actions happen out there? Uh, you know, we are beginning to start seeing these roles come about at a reasonably fast rate. You know, Bella is just one example. There's a few others we see. Uh, you know, if you focus on the installed base, just like we talked about, just like both Sam and Bella talked about, it can only help the OEM's performance. And then, you know, the way I think about it, broadly speaking, is, you know, it's never too late to do this thing, right? Uh, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. Right, and we see Bentley Nevada and a few other people have already done that. We're excited they've started going ahead of this process and doing it. So we really appreciate it uh, in terms of uh, what we saw. You know, there's a, a few thoughts we put together in terms of uh, what the participants here today, what the, the people who attended the session today can get. We put a little ebook together. I think we're going to email that out to you guys later on after the event. Uh, in that email, in that ebook, also by the way, Sam, I referred to Sam's. Uh, Post uh, Thomas Net uh, a few months ago, we've actually embedded that in this particular ebook, Sam. So people will get the uh, post and all its glory and all the information is shared out there with them. So thank you very much for contributing that out here. In terms of entitled the last part, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we've been uh, the big proponents of this role. We're a big. Uh, uh, we have a point of view, if you may, in terms of the install base and the value to the company. And really, what we've built is a platform to modernize the install base workflows, just as you just as you talked about. And we see some great customers that have been partnering with us for the last many years, and we're excited about that. With that, I just want to say thank you very much to Sam and Bella. Really, really appreciate you taking the time, not just today on the call, but the preparation and kind of working our way through this last few weeks of making sure we're prepared for this. Uh, for the attendees who took time out at the lunch hour or the evening hour, and certainly people from India who call them, it's about 11.15 at night, so really appreciate it uh, that you stayed up so late taking the call. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. Appreciate it. And with that, 
Uh, we will wrap up the call. Uh, there's information already for our contact information to Be for Bella. If you want to ask her information about specifics or Sam or myself, and all, all the contact information is there. And after the event ends, uh, the recording will be available to the attendees as well. So again, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. Good night, good evening, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.